Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So, as I explained in my brief Star Wars rant, I am done with Darth Hammer. It's gotten boring and I have to move on to other projects. Uh, these videos will refute the remaining arguments Hammer makes against Muhammad. Some will be refuted very quickly, while others will take a little more time. So, let's get started. Bismillah. Okay, so Hammer claims that Surah Tawbah, verse 29, calls for a plan of world domination, for lack of a better term. Let's look at some commentaries on this verse. Fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day, nor comply with what Allah and His Messenger have forbidden, nor embrace the religion of truth from among those who are given the scripture, until they pay the tax, willingly submitting, fully humbled. Dr. Mustafa Khatab states, in his commentary on this verse, that it discusses dealing with those who violated their agreements and attacked the Muslims. So the context is fighting against those who fight against you. Indeed, classical commentaries note that the verse was revealed on the occasion of the expedition to Tabuk. This is mentioned by Al-Tabari in his commentary. And according to Ibn al-Qayyim in Za'ad al-Ma'ad, the events that led to the expedition to Tabuk involved the killing of Harith ibn Umar al-Azdi, whom Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had sent to Syria with the call to Islam. Harith was murdered by the Khazan governor, Sharhabil. This led to the Battle of Muta, and Tabuk was the follow-up. So Surah Tawbah, verse 29, was revealed in the context of Byzantine aggression. Moreover, the Qur'an prohibits aggression. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 190, states, Fight in the cause of Allah only against those who wage war against you, but do not exceed the limits. Allah does not like transgressors. Christians would probably counter with the predictable argument that Surah 2 verse 190 was abrogated. But was it really? Nope. Ibn Kathir noted in his commentary that some people indeed believed the verse was abrogated by Surah Tawbah verse 5, the so-called verse of the sword. But he refuted uh, this view as not plausible. In fact, the study Quran commentary notes that earlier Muslims, even earlier than Ibn Kathir, such as the Umayyad Caliph Umar ibn Abdul Aziz did not believe the verse was abrogated either. It states, the Umayyad Caliph Umar ibn Abdul Aziz commented on this passage in a letter saying, it meant fight not those who do not fight. So he's saying that it still applies. You don't attack people who don't, don't attack you. So when we look at the, the verses of the Quran, they talk about not attacking those who don't attack you, don't be the aggressor. When you read Surah 929 in that context, it becomes clear that it is not talking about world domination, but rather fighting against aggressors. Next. Okay, 
A tortured people for money. Ugh, I'm going to let discoverthetruth.com take this one. According to Sheikh Alama Shibli Nomani, it notes that the story of Kenana's torture is baseless. Nomani explains that Kenana was actually put to death for killing a Muslim named Mahmud. And even Al Tabari failed to mention any torture. So when we read Tabari's Tariq, his history, volume 8, after mentioning Safiya, Tabari stated that she was married to Kenana bin al Rabi bin Abu al Huqayq, who was killed by Muhammad bin Maslama at the Prophet's order. He was struck on the neck until he died. So you can see there is no mention of torture here. So Kinana was killed, he was executed for the murder of Mahmud, and he was killed by Mahmud's brother, Muhammad. Now let's look at actual torture, biblical style. In Judges 8, the biblical hero Gideon threatened to tear the flesh of the men of Sukkot with thorns and briars for not feeding his soldiers, and followed through on that threat. And in case you don't know what briars look like, here you go. Ouch. Next. Darth Hammer now takes a brief rest from lying and appeals to hypocritical and selective critiques of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. L bought, sold, owned, and traded black African slaves. Uh, yeah, he also had Arab slaves. Slavery was a fact of life in antiquity. Darth Hammer tries to make us sound like only black people were slaves, so it's like a racial thing. And sure, many Arabs were racist and had discriminatory attitudes against black people. And yes, Arabs had black slaves. Even blacks had black slaves. Furthermore, in Islam, slavery is not like chateau slavery, the type we saw in Europe and America. In Islam, slaves are one's brothers and must be fed, clothed, and taken care of. Even when giving work that is burdensome, it is required of the master to actually help with the work. Since when did you ever hear of a plantation order in America working alongside his slaves? This is not chateau slavery. It's not the type of slavery that we have learned about in school. Hammer's critique is also rife with double standards, especially since the Bible approved of slavery and along racial lines. The Israelites were allowed to enslave the Gentiles as per Leviticus 25.44. It says, your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. Remind me again, Darth Hammer, are black people Gentiles? Oh, and also, let's take a look at the glorious messianic age that Hammer's savior looked forward to, where Gentiles like Darth Hammer will serve the Israelites. Isaiah 61.5 talks about foreigners working in the fields while the Israelites serve as the priests. According to the commentator Matthew Poole, these workers may be acquired as slaves in war or as hired labor. But notice the racial discrimination, even in the Messianic age. And we know this is the Messianic age because Jesus quoted from Isaiah 61 in Luke 4. So it's, it's definitely a Messianic chapter according to the New Testament. So much for there is no Jew or Gentile, as Paul claimed. Finally, let's calculate the total number of biblical figures who said slavery was wrong. Oh, it's zero. Not Jesus, not Paul, not Peter, not Moses. No one said slavery was wrong. Beware, <laughs> Next. Ethiopians raisin heads and claimed that Satan looks like a black man. Back to the lying with Darth Hammer. I'm going to let my brother Halal Homer handle the first claim, and then I'll provide some additional points of my own. Okay, lastly, they present this hadith, which many of them present and misuse or falsely quote. They present it to us as if the prophet just made an off the head comment and just said, oh yeah, black people are raisin heads. Stop, point blank, he didn't say anything else. You saying that in Islam's most trusted collections of ahadith, Muhammad calls black people raisin heads? Right. Why do you guys ignore what the hadith says? The hadith says, listen and obey. Listen and obey your chief. 
even if an Ethiopian whose head is like a raisin were made your chief. This is against racism. Remember, his audience was mostly Arab, and yet he's telling them, obey your leader, even if he's an Ethiopian, which would be from a different country. If he wanted to say black people, there is a word for black man in Arabic, you know. It's Rajul Aswad. But he said Ethiopian. So this, how, how are you applying this to all black people, number one? We're not, all black people don't come from Ethiopia, you know that, right? They knew that, that black people were from different parts of Africa, you know that, right? So how are you guys equating Ethiopian with all black people. We, we don't all, our ancestry all does not come from Ethiopia. So this, this argument is totally bogus. Plus, he's saying obey that leader. He's not saying we disregard that leader or rebel. He's saying obey the leader, even if he's Ethiopian. You see? And it said that this thing about raisin head, they said what it meant was it's the hair. You know, some, some, some Africans, we have, uh, uh, you know, tightly little small curls and it looks like little raisins. So they said, this is what this is referring to. It's not derogatory. Excellent. Excellent. Next. X. L. N. Next. Exactly. So. <laughs> Next. Excellent. Okay, so a good explanation by our brother, mashallah. Let me just show how silly hammer logic is. There's another hadith in which the Prophet said that we should obey our leader even if he is a mutilated Ethiopian slave with no nose or ears, as long as he leads according to the Book of Allah. If we use good old hammer logic, it means all Ethiopians, nay, all black people, are mutilated slaves with no noses and ears. But of course this is ridiculous. Additionally, there's another point of view on this topic. The late British Orientalist Bernard Lewis noted in his book Race and Slavery in the Middle East that the Hadith was using an Arabic literary technique known as an argument by the absurd or trajectio ad absurdum. He explains it as the following. A principle is asserted and an extreme, even an absurd, example is given. But the purpose is to show that the principle still applies even in this extreme and absurd formulation. Thus, the meaning of the hadith is that the physical appearance of a person does not matter, no matter how absurd it may be, or unlikely it may be. What matters is whether he leads according to the Book of Allah. So this is, as Brother Halal Homer said, this is anti-racist. Muslim author Habiba Khande reiterates this point in his book, Illuminating the Darkness. He explains that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, wanted to stress the importance of obedience to the legitimate Islamic authority, however unlikely the form in which it appears. Finally, let's look at actual racism, biblical style. In Mark, the biblical Jesus refers to a Gentile woman, and by extension all Gentiles, as a dog. How tragic! According to their savior, Gentiles like Darth Hammer are dogs and need to wait their turn. How then can you have the audacity to accuse Muhammad, peace be upon him, of racism? So in the final assessment and comparison, this is racist. This is not racist. I hope that's clear. As for the ridiculous lie that Satan is a black man, according to Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, let's look at what Ibn Ishaq actually wrote. As we can see, the Prophet was referring to a man named Nabtal ibn al-Harith, who happened to be a black man. But why was he called Satan? Because he was one of the hypocrites. He would sit with the Prophet pretending to be a believer, but then would go to the other hypocrites and talk behind the Prophet's back. So in short, he was called Satan because of his deeds, not because he was black. Darth Hammer clearly lied. Also, why didn't Hammer Talk about the beloved companion Bilal. In a hadith, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that he heard Bilal's footsteps in front of him in paradise. The last time I checked, Satan is not going to be in paradise. So this reiterates the egalitarian principle of Islam. It is piety, not physical appearance, not your race, not your color, not your deformities, not if you have a scar, not if you're an albino, it doesn't matter. What, what determines your status before God is piety, not your physical appearance. Alhamdulillah. Finally, if we use that good old hammer logic, since Jesus called Peter Satan, get behind me Satan, it must mean that Satan is, gasp, 
a Jewish man. Peter was in fact the the Prince of Darkness. Next. Anne had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Ugh, again with this? Okay, so the Bible says that puberty is the age of quote-unquote love. This is made clear in Ezekiel 16, 7 through 8. The Kiel and Delish commentary explains that the verses describe the arrival of puberty, and the famous Christian theologian John Calvin explained this passage as follows. Here God speaks grossly, yet according to the people's comprehension, for he personates a man struck with the beauty of a girl, a girl who has just entered puberty, and offering her marriage. Also, as John Witt Jr. and Robert Kingdon explain in their book, Sex, Marriage, and Family in John Calvin's Geneva, Volume 1, Calvin even allowed marriage contracts to be made before puberty, as long as both parties were free to validate the marriage upon reaching puberty. So he stated, the contracts made before the proper age do not bind the children unless, after they reach puberty, they feel the same way, and voluntarily acknowledge that they consider their premature marriage valid. Witten Kingdon also note that to medieval writers like Calvin, it was the natural law and God's will that fit persons marry when they reach the age of puberty. Also, in his Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas allowed betrothals or engagements as early as age 7, but their consummation could not occur until puberty. This is the exact same thing that happened with Aisha, with the Lawanha. The only difference was that she was six years old instead of seven, and there was a three-year waiting period before the marriage was consummated. Why did they wait three years? They wanted her to enter puberty, which she did. Finally, let me point out that the Talmud states that Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon when she was six years old, which means that she was even younger when David first slept with her. The reason they came to this conclusion was because Bathsheba was the daughter of Iliam, who was the son of Ahithophel, the advisor of David. My own conservative estimate, based on the biblical data, was that Bathsheba was between the ages of 9 and 11 when she gave birth to Solomon. For more on this, you can see my article and videos. Next. Oh, had at least nine wives at one time, even though his own revelations only allowed four. Um, yeah. That was because the verse was revealed after the prophet had already married his wives. Also, the Prophet was forbidden to have more wives, as it states in the Qur'an. It is not lawful for you, O Prophet, to marry more women after this, nor can you replace any of your present wives with another, even if her beauty may attract you, except those bondwomen in your possession, and Allah is ever watchful over all things. Also, David took more, quote-unquote, wives and concubines, and Yahweh approved. In 2 Samuel 5.13 it states, after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. Whereas 1 Kings 15.5 states, For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commandments all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. So the taking of concubines and more wives was not a sin. Okay, we will stop here and hopefully we'll finish off the rest of Hammer's Lies in the next video, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا